Acts 6, 1 says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian or Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas uh, from Antioch and a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them. And so verse 7 says, so the word of God spread the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. I just declare that our hearts and minds are open and ready to receive from you, Lord. And most importantly, Lord, that we take on the heart of Jesus and that is the heart of a servant. And we give you glory, honor, and praise today in Jesus' name. Amen. So we get to see what it looks like when people say yes. So one of the things we were uh, blessed to be able to do this week is we had launch camp. Yeah, let's clap for that. That's right. So launch camp is our annual kids camp for an entire week. Um, uh, Samara, Pastor Brooke, and those uh, kids and youth teams, basically they had a full uh, slate of activities for all of our kids. There were probably about 120 kids and like 150 youth with about 30 high schoolers that came back to volunteer and help out all the youth. And so, of course, that was a full week for us. So all of my examples are going to have to do with little kids and launch camp this week. So, of course, bear with me. But we, had, we did have a great time. And so, of course, uh, it's an opportunity for us to really sow seeds into the hearts and minds of our young ones so that we can raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So one of the things I thought about is that, yes, I want to raise my kids to be disciples. I want Sophia and Sage to follow after Jesus Christ. I want their hearts to go after him of their own accord, uh, of their own volition, that they seek God, that they can be used by the Holy Spirit and all those wonderful things. But when I think about, as I was preparing for this message and thinking about how Jesus, who is the ultimate servant, Right? If I think about Jesus being the ultimate servants, then I want my kids to be the ultimate servant. At the same time, when I ask them to do their chores, when I ask them to do certain things around the house, I can see that I'm probably failing miserably. Right? I have two kids, Sophia and Sage. Sophia is nine, Sage is seven. And you know, I might uh, be to come home and I see you know, some clothes on the floor right next to the hamper. I find the first one that I see. Sophia, why don't you grab those clothes, pick them up, and put them in the hamper? Okay? Sometime later, I come back, I look at the floor, and maybe 80 or 90% of the clothes are gone, but there are a few items left. Sophia, I thought I told you to grab the rest of the clothes uh, from the floor and put into the hamper. She says, I did, but the rest of those are Sage's clothes, (laughs) right? Her sister. And so I'm thinking, okay, she couldn't take a few extra seconds to serve her sister and pick up those clothes. Another example is when I ask them to take the, uh, the dishes out of the dishwasher. First of all, to have a dishwasher as a child, for me, that's a blessing, right? I didn't have a dishwasher growing up, growing up. And so I say, hey, girls, why don't you take the dishes out of the dishwasher, put them up, and put the dirty dishes in? Okay. And what they start off doing, they look at the trays, they start counting the dishes, right? They count the top tray, they count the bottom tray, and to see which tray has the most dishes. And so, of course, they won't, whoever, whatever tray has the most, they don't want that one. But at the same time, because they know um, that they don't want to be doing more work than their sister. So in the area of service, I don't know how I'm faring in terms of how, how we're raising our kids. But this area is really important because Jesus was the ultimate servant. In Matthew 20, it talks about one of the purposes or reasons for Jesus to come to the earth. Uh, 2028, it says, Uh, Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. So the very purpose for Jesus coming to the earth was to serve. He was the ultimate servant. And if I'm going to raise my children to be disciples of Jesus, I have to raise them to serve as well. 
And so when we think about this, I think about today's message and reading through Acts chapter 6. The title for today is The Greatest Among You. Everybody say, The Greatest Among You. One more time, The Greatest Among You. In Matthew 23, verse 11, it says, The greatest among you shall be your servant. The greatest among you. And again, when you look at this word great, it's not necessarily saying the person that you have to put on stage or the person that you have to put on a pedestal, but those people that are significant in the lives of others, those people that do significant things to impact the world and those around them, those are the people that the Bible calls great. The greatest among you will be your servant. We know in this passage, uh, as Jesus was talking to the disciples, he said, you know, it's not going to be like it is in the world with those that are uh, in positions of authority, they rule. But in the kingdom, those that are going to be great among you are going to be your minister or your servant. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is how do we become great, right? How do we become great? Individually, I want to be around a lot of great people. I want to be at a church where great people are, significant people that are significantly serving others and doing significant things in the world. But as we talk about this movement where we're saying we're going to impact the entire state of Florida and make disciples across this entire state in Jacksonville and, you know, South Florida, Tampa, Orlando, all the different places where, you know, we have churches and house churches and things like that. We want this movement to be a movement of significance. We want people, when they see Greenhouse Church in Gainesville, they know that Greenhouse Church is serving this community. We want people, Mike Lane is actually in Tampa for the first week today as senior or lead pastor. So way to go, Mike and Danny. We want people that when they see Greenhouse Tampa, they know that Greenhouse Tampa, even smaller, even though it's a little smaller now, that they're going to serve their community. If we want to be great, if we want to do things of significance, we have to be people that serve. Amen? Amen. I want to be great. I want you to be great. Um, I want what we do for God to be great. Because one of the biggest things that I want God to say say to me is my good and faithful servant, Byron, well done. Because we know that we won't live in this earth and this physical body forever, but the things that we do in our physical body are going to affect our entire eternity. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, we'll put it on the screen. 2 Corinthians 5, I'm sorry, 10 and 5, one of them. But it says, for we must all appear, yes, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, for we must must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So we'll all face a time of judgment. This is not necessarily a bad thing. This is a time where we are absent from the body. We get to be present from God, present with God. But in doing so, we will receive in terms of our eternity is going to depend upon the things that we accomplished and were able to do while in this flesh. It's one thing to say that, Jesus, you are my Lord and you are my Savior and I am born again. Yes, heaven is now your eternal home once you receive him into your heart and you put your trust in him as the salvation of your souls for, your, and the, for the cleansing of your sins. It's another thing for him to say, my good and faithful servant, the things that I gave you to do, you did. You did well. The things that you did while in this earth was not, were not things um, of, of, of self-motivation. you know, motivation. They were things motivated by your willingness and ability and desire to serve others. So we'll talk about the greatest among you. So now let's jump back into chapter 6. As we do so, I'll share the big idea for you today, and that's when God's people decide to serve, the movement happens. When God's people decide to serve, the movement happens. As we see in Acts 6, there was a... Well, first of all, some context. Of course, last week we said, hey, we can't stop the movement. You know, it's going to happen. We don't want to miss it. We're going to say yes to God. And we see a lot of examples in Acts chapter 1 through 4 where people said yes to God. Uh, There are certain verses where it talks about how they had all things common, meaning they had uh, anything that I have, you know, I'm willing to share with those around me. I might sell my goods so that I can give to the church so that they can meet the needs of the needy. So there were, uh, was a lot of great things going on. People were being healed. People were being set free. People were being delivered. The church was moving with lots and lots of momentum. But as we get into chapter 6, what we're seeing is the first opportunity for division. 
right? The first opportunity of complaining where, you know, there was a lot of momentum in the church. The church is growing. The church is expanding. People are being saved. More and more people are being added to the church. But with that comes problems, right? Growth presents problems. And the challenge that we see here is that there's one group of people uh, the Hellenistic or the Grecian Jews, so the Jewish, speak, the Jewish people who spoke Greek and maybe were more culturally Greek than the Hebraic Jews, they were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. So their widows were being neglected. And now every other place where we saw tension in the Old Testament and we saw complaining in the Old Testament, you know, the Bible said a complaint arose among these Hellenistic Jews. When we saw that in the Old Testament, we saw problems, Right? The complaining produced um, just lots of bad things. Moses, you know, he was at one point wanting to kill himself, or he wanted God to kill him because the people complained and they complained. Nothing was ever right. He wanted to kill himself. There were all types of examples of God, you know, putting leprosy on people or allowing leprosy to be put on people, opening up the ground because people complained and they wanted to do their own things. Lots of actions that brought disunity. And so now in the New Testament church, we're seeing an opportunity for this to take place once again. But what happens? Let's continue. Verse 2 says, so the 12 disciples or apostles gathered all the disciples together. So, of course, everybody in the entire congregation, we have a problem in our church. It's not just for Pastor Matt and Pastor Mike to solve the problem, but we want everybody in our congregation to come together and let's take a look at this problem. It says, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables, right? So does this mean that the apostles, you know, didn't respect, didn't honor the, um, the, the, the Grecian Jews? They didn't care about their issue? No, what did they do? They said, brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit, full of wisdom, and then we will turn this responsibility over to them. So there's a problem. They say, we don't need to leave the word of God. Let's do this thing. Let's find uh, seven people. What are the characteristics of a servant, of a New Testament servant? Uh, And really one one thing we think about when we look at this word, this is the establishment of the official office of the deacon in the New Testament church, right? It's the establishment of the official office of the deacon in the New New Testament church. That word deacon in Greek Uh, diakonos is actually seen like 29 times in the New Testament. It's only translated to the word deacon about five times, but every other time it's translated to the word servant, right? So as we read in Matthew 23, the greatest among you shall be your deacon, diakonos, or your servant. And so now we're seeing this office being established. This office is saying, hey, there's a formal role for people who serve in the church And here are the qualifications of those people. Let's take a look at the qualifications. If we look again at verse 3, it says, Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are, number one, known, right? And other translations that say they are of good repute or good reputation. So that's one, the first qualification, is that they are known in the church to have a good reputation. Number two, it says that they should be full of the Spirit, right? full of the Spirit. And we know we're a Spirit-filled church. We believe that God gives men and women spiritual gifts so that everybody can profit. So they're full of the Spirit, number two. Number three is that they should be full of wisdom, right? Because we know that they're real practical problems that need practical solutions. So we need people that can apply themselves to find a solution to the problem. But then number four, it says people that can take responsibility or take ownership. So when we think about the characteristics of a servant in our New Testament church, those are the four characteristics that we're looking for. So we're pulling a lot of good, you know, substance from these chapters. But then after they found them in verse 5, they said, okay, let's put these people over them. They can have responsibility over this issue. And so this proposal, verse 5, pleased everyone, the whole group. So they chose several individuals. Some of the individuals, actually the majority of the names are actually Greek names. Right? So the Grecian Jews were the Jews that were having the, the challenges, and so they chose Grecians to basically solve the problem for the Grecians, but then also manage the entire distribution of the food from this early church in Jerusalem. Verse 6 says they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them, and then verse 7 is really what we dream about as a church. 
meaning there are problems that arise, there are issues, there are challenges. You know, people are complaining for whatever reason because their needs are not being met. And as a church, as the church leadership, we want to address those issues. But at the same time, we're saying if we can have people to step up who are of good character, who are full of the spirit, full of wisdom, who take ownership and responsibility, go and serve those problems, then verse 7 is the result. The word of God increases, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increases rapidly, and a great number of people become obedient to the faith. So what the apostles recognize, they recognize this fundamental truth. Uh, They said that a church whose pastors uh, are chained to the tyranny of the urgent, which often show up in tangible problems, is a church that's removing its heart to strengthen its arm. So this church should always prioritize the word of God. And even though a church without deacons and servants is unhealthy, a church without the word of God being preached is not a church. Amen? Amen. So so, so my goal today as we're going over these scriptures is really so that we can see, so that we can evaluate ourselves and see for ourselves where we are when it comes to serving God's people. And I'm talking about this in the context of the local church. You know, we're talking about the the, the title of our series is The Movement. We know that we have things to do here in the city of Gainesville to impact lives. We want to be a church of significance. As we serve our community, we have outreaches throughout the uh, various parts of the city, people that go out to Holly Heights weekly, uh, Carver Gardens, uh, Pine Ridge, and other parts of this city where we're serving on a regular basis. And when we do that, you know, people see that. One thing that I get to do as the Sunday services director, hub director here, is I get to teach one of our Activate classes. Activate is our first step in terms of our membership process, but in Activate, the first class, we basically talk about the mission, vision, core values of the church, and then I also allow the participants to uh, tell me why Greenhouse, right? Why did you choose Greenhouse Church? Why are you sitting here wanting to be a member of our church? And I hear lots of different things, a lot of very, of course, positive things, but often I'll hear people who tell me that I was at another church, or I was talking to some other Christian, and they told me about Greenhouse. They said, oh, you want a church that values mission? Oh, you need to go to Greenhouse, right? Because they value sending people on mission. They value local mission and doing things in their community. You want a church that's diverse? Oh, you need to go to Greenhouse. And these are pastors and leaders at other churches. They're recommending Greenhouse. Why? Because we are a church, again, and we're continuing to grow in our significance. Why? Because we want to continue to grow in how we serve. Yes. Thank you. Clap for that. And so it's just good to see that the greatest among you will be your servant. And we're not in competition with any other church, but at the same time, I want this church and this movement to be a movement of significance. I want my life to be significant. I want your life to be significant. But if all we do is sit in the pews every Sunday, receive a good word from Pastor Mike or whoever is preaching, and then go home and do nothing to contribute to the well-being of this house and the people around you, right? We lose out on that significance. We might feel good every Sunday, but we lose out on that significance. And so my goal here is really to challenge you as you think about how you serve and are serving, of course, this church, but serving the people that are around you. So the three points that we'll get into, the first one is that, number one, God sees you when you serve. God sees you when you serve, right? I know we don't serve for rewards, You know, we don't necessarily serve because we want to get anything. But at the same time, it's not, in essence, anything wrong with that. When we look at David before he slew Goliath, uh, of course, he knew that he had, you know, opportunities to kill lions and bears, and he was skilled at doing those things. But one question he asks, he says, hey, what's going to be given to the man that that kills this uncircumcised Philistine? And they said, yeah, yeah, you're going to get, you know, you get to marry the, (laughs) the king's daughter. You're going to get riches and all these things, all these accolades added to you. And he says, yes, I want that. I'll take that. That's the reward of his service to his nation. That now he becomes a man of prominence by marrying the king's daughter and getting all these accolades. But not only that, if we look at John chapter 12, verse 26, John 12 and 26, it says, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. 
My father will honor the one who serves me. My father will honor the one who serves me. So when I think about service or when I think about, of course, serving God in this scripture, the fact that, Lord, you will honor me when I serve you. How does that happen? You know, how does that happen? One thing I think about myself as being the hub director and serving here at Greenhouse, I've been on staff for maybe a little over a year now, is, um, you know, people recognize the, the shift that, of course, m- me and my family made in, in order for us to, you know, take on this role as hub director or hub pastor. I used to work, for some of you that don't know, I did used to work at the University of Florida. I was an associate professor in computer science. And so when you're working for this, you know, billion dollar research enterprise, they generally pay their researchers and their associate professors that's doing teaching, research, and service really well, right? But then if you're gonna transition and begin to work for a local church, there's probably some sacrifices that you'll have to make financially, right? Because again, we know one thing that we value here, we value mission, and we endeavor to give 50% of everything that we send out. So every, out of all of our expenditures, we want 50% of those things going to mission, right? So that means the people on staff, of course, are gonna be paid well, but at the same time, we're gonna steward our resources well at the, you know, also. And so with that, there are going to be some sacrifices that we had to make when we made this transition, and people see that. They see me serving, they see me giving of my time, they see me here, you know, sometimes late, sometimes early. Of course, I'm serving, you know, at launch camp last week, um, all those things. And people appreciate the fact that I am here now serving Greenhouse. And so one way that people honor me that I so appreciate, God sees you when when you serve, and God will honor those that serve him, is that people come up to me and share so many words You know, so many words of encouragement. They tell me how they're praying for me. You know, and I truly believe, of course, I truly believe everybody when they say they're praying for me, but there are some key people that every time they see me, they have a word, they have, you know, some encouragement. And I just know that that's God's one way, even though it may not necessarily be financial, that they're praying for me, that they're honoring me, that they're making sure that, you know, I feel good about what God has called me to do. Chris Jate comes to mind. He's one of our elders. Uh, Emma Franks comes to mind. She consistently has a word. And again, when I think about how God honors me in my service, that's what I want for all of us. Because one other way that God honors us is with his attention. There are often times when we go through challenges in life, where we go through uh, situations where we may not be hearing God exactly as we should. You know, maybe God is not speaking in this, in this storm. But if you want God to speak... Go out and serve someone else. Take the focus off of yourself, off of your current problem, off of your current challenge, and go and give yourself to someone else, and God will honor that. He will honor that with his attention. He will honor that with his voice. Even if we think about Job, one of the things that said about Job toward the end of his persecution is that after Job prayed for his friends, he received, you know, everything, you know, in, in multiplication, right? I forget the exact quotation there. But because Job took the focus off of himself and prayed for his friends, he became blessed. And so that's what serving does. God honors us when we serve. Amen? Number two. Yes, clap for that. The church, capital C, needs you to serve, right? The church needs you to serve. There's a lot of things that, you know, we wouldn't accomplish without people joining us in partnership to be able to do it. And it doesn't matter what your gifting is. It doesn't matter um, what skills or tools you have or don't, don't have. Anybody can stand up and serve. One example is even last week as we had launch camp is, you know, Pastor Mike. You know, of course, he's a senior pastor. He's, you know, a great communicator. He can put together great messages and exhort and encourage people. But last week, he was just dad, you know, teaching kids how to play baseball. Right? So again, it doesn't matter how good your skill is in one area, anybody can come out and help kids. And we had several people that gave up their week to do so. Another person that comes to mind was somebody relatively new to Greenhouse, uh, a guy that I first met last week. I saw him you know, serving you know, Monday, t- Monday morning, we chatted, Tuesday morning, we chatted. And I'm thinking, okay, this guy's here you know, during the week. Doesn't he have a job? You know, maybe he's in between jobs or something. Maybe he's falling on hard times. You know, but then as I talk to him more, I find out that he's actually, actually the CEO of a local comp- or of a company, and he lives here locally in, Green- in Gainesville. You know, a guy by the name of Gene Good. One thing I asked him, you know, as I was just thinking about preparing for this message and just hearing his heart about serving, I asked him, why do you like to serve? Why do you serve the way that you do? 
He also has two kids, you know, at launch camp. So he was, you know, serving his kids and there with his kids. But he's there every morning from basically 7.15 to noon. Uh, and he said, you know, well, number one is I get the opportunity to set my own schedule, you know, being the CEO, so I can be here. But then number two, I know that when you're serving in a healthy environment, you know, it refreshes you, right? You become refreshed when you serve others, right? And so I want to be in a church where everybody's happy, fun-loving, refreshed, smiling, you know, every time as they sit here and listen to me speak. Why? Because they're serving others. They're refreshed because, again, it's, it's just so great to give ourselves to the church, to give ourselves to others, one example that I like to uh, point to is my mom before she, uh, so the church needs, to, needs you to serve. And why is that? Because we're family, you know. One example I point to, my mom, before she passed away, she gave me a sign, I mean, several years before, she gave me a sign that I had up on my, on my wall. It said, the king is always right. The king is always right. Now, she gave me that in jest because she knows I have a strong opinion about everything, especially when it came to her. But I like the fact that, you know, she called me the king. So I often like to see myself coming into my home as the head of my household, in quotes, <laughs> as the king. You know, how would the king and what would the king do coming into his home? Well, the way I picture myself is that, you know, it's a long day of work. I'm serving all the people at church, you know, at Greenhouse. I come home, get out of my car, open the door. I see my two little princesses. Sophia and Sage, they come and greet me and they say, welcome home, Father. We're so glad that you're here. <laughs> Maybe I have my little rubber work workout ring and they just grab my hand and kiss my ring and lead me over to my seat, you know, sit me down, pick my feet up. And then the queen, my lovely wife, Lakeisha, sitting right here up front, she comes with a tray of, you know, mixed fruit and nuts and cut up uh, delicacies and she sets them right there before me, you know, with maybe a Sprite or a uh, sparkling water, rather, that I can drink. She kisses me on my cheek and goes on about her business. Um, the, my children ask me, the two princesses, what would you like to do, Daddy? Would you like to watch TV or would you like to read your book? I say, I want to read my book. Go and grab my book from the library and bring it to me. I start reading my book. Maybe some time later, I have a little bell right there next to me. I grab my bell. Ring the bell, Lakeisha comes back or someone comes back. And I say, you know what, I think I want to watch a little ESPN. Can you go and turn the TV on and make sure it's at the right volume? Man, that's a dream, right? I'm glad you can all share in that dream with me. That's a dream. But what really happens, what really happens is that as I leave work, maybe a little late, I leave work, I'm on my way home. I've already taken the kids to school that morning. We have an agreement in our household. I take the school, kids to school in the morning, but Keisha picks them up in the afternoon. But I get a call. Byron, I'm running a little late. There's a lot of traffic. Can you pick the kids up? Oh, it's not my turn. It's not my job. I don't want to pick the kids up. Okay, I'll go and pick up the kids. I get the kids. We get home. Daddy, I'm hungry. Well, mommy's not home yet. What are we going to do? I don't know. Right? I go and I look in their room and those same clothes from earlier are on the floor. You know, uh, the trash needs to be taken out. I have to go in and take the trash out. You know, all these things that have to happen because, and, I, and, I, and, and, and so even though I don't have my ideal image of what I think should happen, I still do all the other things anyway. Why? Because that's my home and this is my family. Right? And so what I want to say to you is that we are a faith family, right? We are a family. We come together to, to, to learn the word of God. We come together in micro churches to share and to be disciples. Uh, we come together in so many different ways. And this is an extension of your home, right? We are all family. And in a family, everybody pitches in, whether it's taking out the trash, whether it's the person that knows how to cook, uh, no matter what the skill, big or small, everybody pitches in when you're family. The church needs you to serve. The third point, when we serve, we become great. 
when we serve, we become great. Also, when you serve, you become great. Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 20 and 26. Of course, I kind of alluded to this scripture earlier, but it says, you know, this is Jesus kind of correcting the disciples. He says, you know, when the Gentiles, you know, want to exercise authority over one another, they make sure that they have titles, etc. But then in verse 26, it says, it's not going to be so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as, so just like the Son of Man, he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And we know that when the book of John talks about Jesus, it talks about all the things that he did. You know, but even in all the things that Jesus accomplished on the earth, he says there's not enough books to talk about all the great things that Jesus accomplished in this earth. And I really want the same to be said about us. I want the, the same at some level to be said about me. That even though, you know, we did a lot of uh, uh, great things, you know, or even though, you know, we want to do a lot of great things, the idea is that if I want to be significant, if I want our church and this movement to be significant, this is going to be a movement of individuals that are going out of their way to serve others, that are giving of their own time, giving of their own resources, because our goal is to be like and to reflect Jesus. If he came not to be served, but to serve, then we come into this house as family, not just to receive, not just to hear a good message, not just to enjoy the worship team, but we also have to give back, right? Because that's what Jesus did. So when we serve, we become great. But then also when you serve, you become great. You have a life of significance. Uh, Luke chapter 12, my example here. Luke chapter 12, verse 42. It says, the Lord answered, who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. I tell you the truth. He will put him in charge of all of his possessions. So that greatness is now God giving you more responsibility. He's ex uh, opening uh, and ex exceeding or, or increasing your capacity. You know, there's no one in this earth or in, in the church, rather, that serves well on Sundays or Wednesday nights or serves their community well as a volunteer that won't serve their job well when they're getting paid, right? It's just a culture, a piece of, of, of life. Like, I mean, just the concept of, you know, who you are on Sunday morning in terms of if you are a person that serves and gives yourself, God will see that when you go out to the workplace and to the marketplace, the skills even that you develop as you serve in the church will translate wherever you go. He's going to give you additional responsibilities and capacity, and he will put you in charge of all of his possessions, as this parable tells us. It's almost like when I think about, again, going back to launch camp this week and thinking about my daughters, you know, there were times, you know, they're about two and a half years apart. There were times where, you know, uh, maybe Sage was two, Sophia was four, or maybe, you know, Sage was four, Sophia was six and a half, seven, where there were things that I wouldn't ask Sage to do because I just knew she just couldn't handle it or she just wasn't ready. I couldn't give her a series of instructions, right? I couldn't speak to her about certain things because she just wasn't as mature as the older sister. The older sister, Sophia, I could say, hey, Sophia, I want you to step one, you know, do this, step two, do that, step three, four, five, and let her go, and she'll handle all of those steps. But then Sage, I have to kind of talk to her at a different level. And so my point there is that if we really want God to entrust us, to speak to us, to give us responsibility, to see us as men and, and women that can take on uh, um, his call and his, his passion and his uh, capacity to, to, to do in this earth, I want God to use me. I want God to know that, yes, I have the heart of Jesus. I am here to be used by you. And as you use me, you will continue to bless and increase me and just continue to speak to me. And, and so I thank God for that. So when we serve, we come, become great. When you serve, you become great. So again, that um, big idea, when God's people decide to serve, the movement happens. And so how is this seen in the gospel? 
you know, how does this point to Jesus? We've already said that Jesus came not to serve, but to be served. But we also see the attitude of all of his apostles as they wrote letters or epistles to the various churches where they visited. Right. So, of course, Paul, you know, was the writer of the majority of the New Testament, wrote lots of epistles. But then Jude and James and Peter, they wrote their own epistles. And one thing that's fascinating to me about how they took on the heart of Jesus and how we're expected to do the same is how they introduced themselves at the beginning of each of those epistles. Right. And so, say, for example, Philippians 1.1. I don't know if we'll have it. I'll just read it here. Philippians 1, chapter 1, it's, uh, it says, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and the deacons. What was the introduction? Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. If we look at 2 Peter chapter 1 in verse 1, the introduction of uh, Peter's second epistle, he says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith or faith of an equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So Peter, who was an apostle, says, no, I'm introducing myself first as servant, second as apostle. Of course, James did it, Jude did it, and finally Revelation 1.1, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. God is going to reveal things to those who serve him, who take on his heart to serve others. They identified as followers of Jesus Christ, and their identity was in their service. And so these acts of service, when we go out and serve others, they have a lasting effect. One of the things Pastor Mike said that I really enjoyed, he says this last week, he said, you know, it's, it's going to be like you, all the times you said yes, it's going to be like you, you get to, and then you get to heaven, you know, it's going to be like you have an opportunity to watch your life on TV, a TV reel of your life, and you can see all the times where you said yes and the impact that it had. Well, it, him saying that made me think about one of my favorite movies from about 20 years ago. It's a movie called The Sixth Sense. Anybody saw the movie The Sixth Sense? Raise your hand. Okay, most of us. If you hadn't, you know, you probably should have watched it over these last 20 years. Uh, it's, you know, if, you know, it's kind of scary, so I'm not necessarily recommending it. But if you hadn't, get ready for a spoiler alert. So it was a kid in this movie, and in this movie, he, um, you see the commercials or the trailers, and one of the things he said is that, I see dead people, and they don't even know that they're alive, right? And so that added a lot of a suspense. And so in this movie, this kid who lost his father is having lots of issues in life. You know, one, he sees dead people, or at least thinks he's seeing dead people, according to his mom. And we see this psychologist or psychiatrist that's walking around with him, kind of giving him counsel, trying to help him out and help out his family and everything else. So there's lots of encounters between him and this psychiatrist all throughout the movie. But then one of the things that get me is at the end, what, what, it, what turns out is that this guy is actually dead himself. Right? So kind of weird, I know, kind of weird. I'm not necessarily recommending it. But this guy who's walking around and we're watching this movie as if he was alive, interacting with all these different people, at the end, we finally see it realized that this guy is dead himself. But you never notice it until the big reveal at the end. And so what happens? The first time I saw it, of course, I was in the theaters. I was like, oh, man, mind blown. This dude was dead. I didn't notice it. But the minute it comes out on DVD... (laughs) You know, back in those days, the minute it comes out on DVD, I put it in, I start watching it, and I'm looking at all these occurrences. Oh, he's dead right there. I didn't notice he's dead right there. Nobody's paying attention to him but the little boy. He's actually dead right there, too. I'm thinking he's counseling or talking with the mom, but he never said anything. He's dead right there. He's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead, in all these different uh, situations. And so one of the things I thought about is like, man, when we get to go back and watch the movie of our life, it'll be the exact opposite, right? It'll be the exact opposite because when you die, you'll get to see that how now dead in terms of your physical body, all the times where you served and gave yourself to others and it brought life, right? 
So all the times, whether it's maybe you greeting at the hospitality room, whether you're up here lifting your hands in worship, whether you're, you know, serving at launch camp, you serve at our Father's Day, whether you, you know, give somebody, you know, pay for somebody's meal at a restaurant, all the times where you serve somebody and because you serve them, it brought life. You, you'll be able to see how you impacted people through your service. And I truly believe that we get to rejoice. So even though we go, as uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says, and sit at the judgment seat of Christ, when we are people that serve and give our lives to others, it will be a time of rejoicing. Amen. And so, you know, the the goal today is really so we can kind of just check ourselves and see where we are in terms of serving. Um, But it's also to say, hey, let's make a decision. Because when God's people decide to serve, the movement happens. Final scripture, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 9. My favorite scripture here because of some of the words and my role here. But 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 9, it starts out by saying, offer hospitality. Or the way I like to translate that, it's join the hospitality team. (laughs) Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. 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 So let's go out and let's serve people.